Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Larry Kramer was the founder of MarketWatch.com. He's also been the president and publisher of USA Today, and he's currently interim CEO of TheStreet.com. In this episode, we talk to him about creating a brand like MarketWatch in a space dominated by powerful incumbents like The Wall Street Journal, CNBC, and others. But we also hear what it was like to work in the legendary Washington Post newsroom in the 1970s and 80s, as well as what it takes to bring success to modern media properties like USA Today in the digital era. If you want a first-hand primer of when digital and old world media collided, you couldn't do better than listen to the career path of Larry Kramer. Please enjoy. Larry Kramer, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Thanks for having me, Brian. I, I feel like I could do a whole separate episode with you about your, your career in, as a journalist. Um, so I want to hit the headlines <laughs> just, for, just for a little bit for intro. Like you, you covered Woodstock, you covered the Patty Hearst case, um, you work at the Washington Post in the 70s, you work under you know, the legendary Ben, ben Bradley. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, was there any unique experiences being a journalist that prepared you for being an entrepreneur? Wow, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think you learn a lot about um, about, a tre- about dealing with an audience, about understanding it's about what your audience wants, not what you want, the closer you get to an audience. Mm. So for my period as a journalist, I did some of those things as a photographer and some of those things as a writer. I always loved photography because you had to be there and you really could read the reaction to something you were doing and, and see what's going on. And it, I, I kind of learned that there was no substitute for being as close as you can to what was happening. So that was the, one of the first things. And so, so even as a writer, I I did better stories when I was there and not on the phone or you know the closer you are. So knowing your audience and, and was critical. Um, and I think for the internet, uh, that became like, that became a huge issue as time went on because how people were consuming your content was changing. And if you didn't understand that, you know, a lot of places went, got into trouble by trying to do what it is they do and just put it on this other thing. You know, the, what print was where I came from and they was notoriously the worst, you know, the Print, it seemed easy. You just take the words, it's going to be easier now, we'll just run it on this screen. What we would call repurposing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was, um, you know, that was traditional media. The, the traditional media always felt, you know, what we were doing was great, and this was just going to allow you to get it faster and easier. And didn't understand that this was going to allow you to think differently, to, to you know, to do... And it it was realizing at some point early on that this, what was happening was a Gutenberg moment, was a a moment that something so profound was happening that storytelling was going to change. And, you know, this was another phase just like, you know, from chiseling on rocks to writing on a pencil to publishing a book where you got, where, where suddenly you could have an idea and, and a thousand people could understand it when you couldn't read, you had to talk to one at a time before that. Well, this was something like that that was going on and that you had to st- sit and redefine storytelling. And, and so I, I thought, you know, covering, you know, being a journalist, being out among people and watching how they absorbed content or, or how they connected with me w- was amazing. So early days when I was a print writer, I was a, at the Washington Post, as you mentioned, yet when I was young, I'd write a front page story and I thought I was, you know, the shits, man. This was, <laughs> that was as good as it got. And, you know, two weeks later, I'd get a half a dozen letters. 
mm. from people saying, hey, great story, you know, you really did something. And I'd feel just wonderful. Like I'd reached people, and I'm sure there were just another million people out there, felt the same way, but didn't need to take the trouble to write. Right. When uh, I founded Market Watch, you know, a decade later, a couple decades later, I did a, uh, whatever it was, I did a, um, I remember the first thing I personally wrote for Market Watch, which was just a, an editorial column about, it was around 9-11, and it was a, a um, just a, a, a call about the markets, about getting back in, kind of a, a you know, it wasn't that brilliant, it was, but it was an opinion column about how we should invest again. And I remember going back to my desk and like eating a sandwich and looking up and there were 500 emails. And I just said, oh my God. And, and understand that if you're really, if you can get over the fact that you're not a newspaper writer, but you're a storyteller, you're a journalist, this was so much more powerful and profound than anything you had seen before. You kind of got the gist of what was happening and how big it was. Mm -hmm. And it took, a, but for a lot of people, they didn't. I mean, I, you can look again, there's a, there's a look at the history of the New York Times in the internet. They spent a fortune in the early days to really become part of this, particularly on video and things like that. They never included it in what they did. They, they created like a separate video thing. They didn't understand that it was now part of the storytelling. You know? The holistic package. The holistic package. And, they, and so for me, actually, you know, there were two or three moments I just remember when that got hit home really well. One was when I saw the first iPad and I'm looking at a children's book because they all had children's books on the first ones, one children's book. This one was like Cat in the Hat or something. And you'd, you could see that it was a total replication of a book. So you said, oh, well, this is just a book on here. And you start turning the pages. Then you'd look at it and you'd like, touch the ball in the corner. It would say ball. And the word ball would come up, spelled correctly. Mm -hmm. And you realize that the, when you're a kid and you're looking at that, the cognitive learning was probably going at about three times the speed that you're used to a little kid reading a book, what he would learn. And you kind of go, wow. When that happens, and it happens over and over again for a young kid, they're gonna have that expectation in the future. And so if your story doesn't have, you can't touch right. the word in your story, or you can't do that, you're gonna, be, you're gonna have a problem. So it was became more of a little bit more fear than excitement at some point, you know? So you're, yeah, I, I can see how those lessons primed you almost for this transition. And, um, let, let's get let's get into your story. So, um, by the late '80s, your executive editor at the San Francisco Examiner, right. which I've heard you say was your dream job, it was. But then a recession hits around '89, '90, and then it suddenly is not the dream job anymore. Right. So you decide to. So I have yeah, I have three choices. I I, I decide I've got to move on. At five years in the job, I'd been and it had was my dream job, and I had gotten it when I was 35. You know. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought, this is, this is great. And Will Hurst was my boss, who was wonderful. We had been re young reporters together 10 years earlier at The Examiner. Um, during the time I was here, by the way, he and one of our reporters, John Markoff, introduced me to, what the, to the internet, which was in the 80s. Nobody had really heard of, but Will had like a, a, a Mac, and, which was also kind of unusual in the <laughs> late 80s. Um, but he, and he was typing messages to his Harvard professors in Boston, it was DARPA, and he, and he was, and I couldn't believe it. I saw it and I was like, what, what's going on here, you know? And he said, this thing's gonna be really cool, you know, but I don't know when, but, it was right. just, but he was doing it because of the, the Harvard connection and the education connection. Education and military were the two people using it at the time. But I didn't think that much of it. It still was, it looked like a teletype machine. I mean, you weren't, it was not, it was just words. It was just messaging, man. Like, a, you know, the Wells Fargo, or what, what, well, um, you were, you were sending like a telegraph message. And, and, um, but it was happening fast, and I thought that was cool. But yes, the things, got, things got really tough, and, um, and I, I just burned out. And, and Will and I, were, we, were, we were great friends, but uh, you know, his family owned the paper, and he was feeling a little trapped himself. And we just felt like we had, to, we had built these bureaus in Europe and in Asia, Things were going really great. And then the, the economy hit, we had to close them all and bring them in. It was just, it was almost a year of like doing depressing things. Layoffs and, and Layoffs yeah. and stuff, which was, you know, I just wasn't mentally prepared for it. I'd never been through it or anything like that. So I said, I got to get out of this. And, I, and it was amazing because all I'd wanted to do was, since I was like 11, was do this, right? So uh, 
a friend of mine worked at a company called Data Broadcasting Corp in, in um, San Mateo, which was, ironically, was part of a bigger company that was in New York, was having financial troubles, but the bigger company owned FNN, Financial News Network, the first financial news network. Predecessor to CNBC. Correct. And CNBC started separately, but mm -hmm. they were two businesses at this point. And uh, they had this handheld device called the Quotrec. This was in 1990. And it, it gave you, it, it was the only portable device that got real-time stock quotes. But it used FM sideband. So the, the, the feed was, was um, embedded in an FM radio signal. So it was effectively a radio receiver. It looked like those early brick phones. But it was a radio receiver. And you could, you, at the receiving end, you could sort out the data and it would show on the screen. And you could pick your stocks and those stocks would update in real time. And uh, so to the, there were, I don't know, 10,000 of those out there to intense traders who wanted something portable. No internet then, right? Subscription product. It was 200 a month. Uh -huh. And it would be cost 150 of that 200 was uh, exchange fees. You had to pay the exchanges to get real-time data. Mm -hmm. So each customer had to do it. It wasn't a cheap product. But if you're a broker and, or whatever, it was an amazing chance to go somewhere and actually stay in touch with what was going on in the market. If you had to react, you could react quickly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and he, had, he was the head of marketing there, and that company was doing well, but it was sending all of its profits back to New York because FNN was bankrupt, and all these places were losing money that were the other companies that were related, that were in the same umbrella, corporate umbrella. And there were some shenanigans going on back there. I don't know what it was, but he said to me, he had this idea that because they had, they owned the FM sideband this this signal in 50 cities you had to actually make a deal with a radio station in each city uh, uh -huh. to buy five percent of their signal. spectrum yeah and do it right and they had set that up it had taken them years but it was working and they had gotten this network up and it was and they were making money but they were using it monday through friday nine to five mm. for the market but they weren't they had it the rest of, all they would do is keep repeating the market closing market numbers all night or all weekend and so it, it was, he had this idea that we should use it nights and weekends for something like sports, which was great because there'd be games at night, there, week, there are no, ba basically no sports events, very few during the day. At 9 a.m. Yeah. Right, at 9 a.m. and it's work day, right? And, uh, and they said to him, look, it's an interesting idea, but we can't afford to do it. We have to send all of our profits back east. We're not doing any investing. But if you want to start a company... We'll house you. We'll give you everything we can that's not cash. Mm -hmm. um, and even we'll even make you want to use our equipment. The idea was to use their equipment and build a separate, you know, a, 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 just a, a, the guts a little differently. So it took sports, mm -hmm. basically. And, and even part of the deal was they could then have sports on their market machines because they knew most of the mo brokers love sports too. Mm -hmm. And it would keep you, it would be the only way you could keep up to an out-of-town sports event. There was no ESPN Sports Center then. ESPN was around, but it was broadcasting, you know, boxing matches. They weren't in the news business. They weren't in the news yeah. business yet. And John uh, Walsh hadn't started Sports Center and it hadn't become So it was So this was a kind of a cool idea, right? And um, he said, "Why don't you come to me and let's get let's you and I start a company." They'll give us a place to be. They'll, it'll be a gifted startup. They'll mm -hmm. cover our early costs. We'll raise like half a million dollars to do, to do the development work. We'll even use their engineers. We'll pay them uh, you know, extra hours to work on us. And we'll use their network. We'll use all that stuff. We just have to create a sports version of it and, and understand how to market it. And I said, you know, this is really interesting. So I went, had a meeting with my family saying, look, uh, you know, I've been in the newspaper business for 20 years. We've lived in this beautiful house in Tiburon overlooking San Francisco. I said, I think um, it's time for me to make a change. And they're all looking at me like, oh. Mm -hmm. And I said, so we have three choices. I had a, I had a job offer in Atlanta from CNN, uh -huh. which was also in its infant stages. Tom Murphy had just taken over. He was the editor. He was the publisher of the LA Times, and he'd been hired by CNN to make it newsier and, and, and run the business. Mm -hmm. And he had... And I'd known him because he was in L.A. when I was in San Francisco at running the Examiner. He had called to see if I wanted to be news editor of CNN, this new thing. I had an offer from the New York Times. I'd been a stringer for the Times while I worked for the Examiner in the early days, so they knew me. And they wanted me to come be like assistant business editor of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Or I could stay in San Francisco and do this. 
and I, I had my family. My daughter was like five. My son was like, I don't know, nine. We're sitting out on this beautiful deck looking at the city. I said, guys, we have a few choices here. I want to know what you think. And they're listening to me tell them the three choices. And of course, you know, two of them mean we're moving, right? They send me off the deck. I said, well, we need to caucus, <laughs> right? I was like, excuse me? It was like my daughter's yeah. comment. I, I'm sitting in the living room looking out the window at the three of them in this animated conversation. They call me back out. Uh -huh. And they say, you know, you, we think you should do whatever you think is right for you. Um, and if it's New York or Atlanta, we'll see you on weekends. Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, let me get this straight. <laughs> I can do anything I want to do, but you're not moving. You're out. And they said, yeah. Yeah. So, so I said, okay, I guess I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I lived in Tiburon where there were tons of entrepreneurs living because that's where they lived in the sure. Bay Area, yeah. right? And, they, and all, I'd ask them all for advice, and they all would tell me the same thing. You know, you can do this. You're smart enough. It's all about your gut. You just have to learn. If you're starting a business, it's your stomach. You're going to have to go through the roller coaster ringer every week. Mm. Every deal you do is going to be dropped down, dead, not going to happen five times before it does. You have to have a stomach that can handle that. And you have to worry about, you know, you're going to have a family and kids, how long you're going to stay in the house and the whole thing. It was a really interesting lesson for me, but it was so many of them had been through so many startups. They, it was the one common denominator. And you know this isn't a this isn't a uh, a technology discussion. This is an entrepreneurism discussion. But in a lot of ways, it's the same thing in yeah, today's world. Yeah. So I did it, and I, I stayed, and I went and started that business. Um, look, I learned an amazing lesson early on that's helped me later. So I thought everybody on earth would want every sports fan on earth would want this. They could follow their game. You could see I could see what the Syracuse basketball team was doing basket by basket. I could see what the Knicks were doing. I could see every team I'd ever had anything to do with because I lived in San Francisco. And it was this would be really cool. Um, and we had to we only had to charge you know enough for us to afford to do all to buy the feeds and stuff and it was like you know, thirty to forty dollars a, a, a month to people, not two hundred dollars a month. And we, I got, because we had no money to market it. I got um, the um, uh, Sporting News, which is a popular magazine then, to buy in and brand it with their brand on it and promote it in the magazine for free. So I didn't have to buy advertising. Yeah. I didn't have. I kept costs way down. You know, just paid the engineers to do what they had to do. Just we had a little office in their office. I didn't even have to pay rent. They were letting us do it, and they owned like ten percent of the company. And the uh, we gave the first we we gave a whole bunch of them out for free. We said we we have a free trial, and you know thousands of people signed up. And all the reaction we were getting was we love this thing. And then when it came time to start to pay, we got ninety percent of them back. Mm. They said, we love it, but, you know, for 30 bucks a month, you know, I'll wait for the paper. Or I'll do, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'd rather have it on TV or I'd rather have it somewhere, but I don't, but I'll get it eventually. And it was a lesson that, you know, unless you actually were making money with it, paying money was difficult. So for the, you know, the, the same, I'd learned it because I'd learned it from the, from also from the financial side. The people who paid 200 a month for that handheld device were the people who were who could make it back in a trade. You know, one trade that they caught because of it more than paid for it. The people who did it just because they loved seeing where their stocks are going, and stocks are really going up at the time, so everybody was feeling richer every time they checked their stocks, right? Mm -hmm. Those people loved having it, but when it came to paying for it, there wasn't like a payback. It wasn't it, vital. It wasn't vital. You weren't going to do it. You had to think of them and how important it was to them, not just is it cool. Uh -huh. And, and that, that was a you know, tough lesson. What, it, what I learned in the sports side was there was a category of people like that, intense betters. And, and by accident, the last thing I put on the product was, a, was live odds of what was going, of, of, from 10 casinos from, from Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. And the guy who sets those odds, the opening odds then, was a guy named Mike Roxborough, Roxy Roxborough, who had taken over for Jimmy the Greek, but was a really buttoned down guy heavily computerized, the whole thing. And he did it for 20 years there. And he became later became a partner and we bought his company and all that stuff. But he was just, I run, this is totally bizarre, but last night I had dinner with him. He's, oh, wow. He passed through, I hadn't seen him in 10 years. Yeah. He just passed through. But his, his 
So I had odds in there, and every bookie in the country had to have it because they could see they could see a line move before the whoever they were dealing with, you know, whoever they lay, lay oh, right. money with, or every better could see a line move before his bookie. He'd know to make that bet before or after. Don't make the bet because it's about to move, or make the bet because it's about to move in the other direction, right? And so it was money to them. So that was our version of the heavy trader. Right. And, but suddenly, everybody wanted to pay cash for it. They <laughs> wanted to... Guys would show up in San Mateo in our offices, which was With not a envelope. retail office, an envelope of cash saying, I'll buy three years in advance. <laughs> and then I'd get calls from... I, we had to add a cancellation code. I'll never forget this. DBC had to add a cancellation code because they were, they were handling our you know customer support and everything for us right it was in there it was it was a dbc device it just mm -hmm. said sport tracks on it. it it was with the product and so the, but they we we you know for part of the 40 percent of gross they got they had to do all these things transmit it use their equipment all that stuff and they so they had to add a cancellation code of seized by law enforcement authorities <laughs> because these police departments would call after they'd bust some bookie ring and they'd say we, they'd see these devices and they'd call Customer service say, how do I get this thing turned on? And they say, well, you pay us. <laughs> he said, well, no, we've seized it. It's the Seattle Police Department. Mm -hmm. And we seized it. We said, well, that's fine. But you still pay us if you want to see it working. We're not, we're not going to give it away. Sort you of know? like unlocking an iPhone or something. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so it was, it was funny. But it was an early lesson that you could do something cool. But it ha you had to really understand why somebody would want that. And it had to be a payoff for them that they could believe if you were going to charge them money. Well, and that's so that's so interesting for what's about to come next, right. is understanding what media people are willing to pay for and in what circumstances. Yes, which is all over. And I've had a my last gig, the one I, you know, last job I really had was uh, running USA Today. And USA Today had a unique problem. It was not only do people think it should be free on the internet like they do about everything, People thought USA Today should be free in print mm. because most of them didn't pay. Ninety percent of them, the hotel paid us. Put it and, under the door and, yeah. and put it under the door, or did it? A huge percentage of it was really over fifty percent were hotels or airlines, mm -hmm. and people loved it. They read it, and the hotels would not have keep kept, would not keep paying us if they didn't wasn't something their customers said they wanted, but the customer didn't have to pay for it. And it was just a thing they got because they went to the room. They loved it, though. They, I mean, it was a, it was one of the most beloved brands I've ever been but associated with. But they've been with. trained to not pay for it. Correct. Right. And so, at, you know, at Gannett, one of the jobs, the three jobs I had when I they asked me to take over USA Today was one was to, you know, cut the losses. There were losses and, and growing losses. Make it much more digital. It was fledgling digital operation at the time. It's like five years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I mean, still had good numbers, but it wasn't making money. It wasn't bringing in a lot of money. Um, and they wanted me to take advantage of the local newspapers in the chain. There were 100, almost 100 local newspapers. And the history of Gannett was that the local papers and, Gannett, and USA Today hated each other because USA Today was built on the backs of the local papers. When they started USA Today 40, 35 years ago, the actual um, staff was half, half of the staff, came, editorial staff, came from the local papers who were given the privilege of still paying those salaries, mm. even though the person was working at USA Today. They were trying to get USA Today off the ground, right? And then when USA Today would miss its budgets, the local papers had to cut mm. to offset the losses at USA Today. So you can imagine the relationship over 30 years of that, yeah. where editors in, you know, in uh, Louisville would see their best reporters come to Washington, work for USA Today. They're still paying their salary. They couldn't replace them. <laughs> and, and, you know, and they're getting squeezed. Yeah. And you got to lay people off, right? So the, the irony was it, was, it was through the local papers that I was able to unlock value for USA Today. I couldn't go... We were very nervous about going to charge on digital, which, again, for the reasons I told you, because people are used to getting it for free anyway. Um, and especially in today's world where national news, there's so many versions of it available for free, right? Um, but I knew that on the print side that people still valued the product. Even though they had been handed to them, they really had a, a value to them. In some cases, it was why they went to a hotel, right? I mean, believe it or not, it yeah. was. 
So our local papers were way ahead of us in charging. All of the Gannett local papers started charging three years ago and, and on digital. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to him and said, what if we did a, what if we did a print deal where we, put, we told the local papers to stop covering any national news, any national foreign news. They were all running wires at that point. You know, the era of bureaus for the Des Moines Register around the world, or, you know, they, they were gone. Nobody was, they, they already had to have cut that. Their job at that point was be the best local news source they could and own the local audience. And I said to him, okay, why don't we take the USA Today brand, which is beloved everywhere in the country. The research was off the charts. There was no place in the country that didn't love USA. Whether they read it or not, they mm -hmm. loved it. And why don't we make USA Today the second section of each paper. I've seen that. Right? Yeah. And and so and then we, we constructed a test with four papers that would show what impact that would have on the paper. And we built this storyline saying it was going to be more of everything. We weren't just going to add USA Today, we were going to add more local new, give the local people more ability more staff and more pages to do local news because they wouldn't be concentrating at all on national. Right. We this this section would come to them, you know, just digitally. It would like just be come over the wires and be go right into their paper. They didn't have to do anything. Um, and but there would be two brands. It would be the value of two brands, not one. I mean, there was already a value of USA Today on the streets of you know dollar, two dollars at that point. And and the paper, or local paper, was sold for a buck. We don't we we would raise the rates, but we would test the, what we could raise the rates. It wasn't going to be a lot. It would be a quarter or something. And you'd get both, and it would, and we we pushed it like we pushed television, you know, NBC News, Channel Four, right? right? They're on one, well, two brands, one channel, right? And um, we said we added up the additional cost, and the additional cost essentially was only newsprint. Mm -hmm. We were adding a certain number of pages of newsprint into each paper, which is a lot. It's expensive, and but we. We are the cheapest buyer. We, we spend the least for newsprint of anybody per page because we're the biggest buyer, right? Um, and over the course of a year, we did the top 30 papers ultimately. We made $50 million. I mean, we had almost $60 million in additional revenue and probably 10 to $15 million in cost. So it's not just cost savings, it's actual... We made it through uh, changes in, uh, um, it wasn't cost savings at all. Okay, right. It it's was entirely earnings, through yeah. uh, dropping the churn at every paper where we were, uh. um, increasing what people were willing to pay for the paper. So we could increase the price on the paper, whereas there had been resistance the last time we increased the price, right? Mm -hmm. No resistance this time. Nobody quit. Mm. You know, we, and we, we tested all kinds of scenarios against papers where we didn't do it. And it was a very clear pattern, and we could calculate that that chain wide we had we made almost fifty million dollars in profit on a print product by investing in it, which hadn't been done in twenty years. Mm -hmm. But the message was, look, these are people. These are instead of me trying to get eighteen year olds to read a newspaper, these are people who liked reading a newspaper. Why not get if you gave them a better paper, they would pay more. Mm. How long will that go on? I don't know. What's the trajectory? I don't know. But there was money to be made in the newspaper business because we had these two brands. By adding value. By adding value. And that was a clear value add. If I had taken those very same stories and just replaced AP stories with them in the paper, yeah. nobody would have noticed. Right. Nothing would have happened. But it was a brand it was the value of the brand, it was the value and it proved that the value of USA Today was less about the actual stories than about presentation. Than about how we told that story. That we always had color, we always had graphics, we always had, you know, more than anybody else. Shorter stories, more de more details in different ways, mm -hmm. you know, lots of pictures, lots of graphics, captions. And you could see that people when we did research on it, you could see that we, there was a type of person who that was the ideal way to read. They, they preferred knowing a lot about, a little bit about a lot of things rather than, you know, the best, you know, the best story about the ag department raising orange prices, which was 20 inches in the New York Times, would be four or five inches in USA Today, but with an orange and the pr a chart showing what the price right. of oranges at the grocery store are going to be, a picture of the head of the ag department, who you now learn is a woman, and, you know, these four or five salient facts, which if you didn't even read the four inches, you picked up scanning the paper, which mm -hmm. you couldn't do, the New York Times or the Journal, or, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't into graphics then, they weren't 
running short stories. They were, it was a different, so we learned in many ways it was a precursor to the internet. We learned that there was an audience that to whom, how they got that information and how they were able to, how quickly they were able to absorb it and use it was more important than just being, just being the best story, which would be longer stories. And it, that mattered in the internet. For us, that was a great pathway to the internet because we, we used the same m mindset. It wasn't just the best words, but you needed these other things to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And it was fantastic. It really, you know, and then, so we did it and unlocked a huge amount of value in the, in the print papers, made more money, got profitable. And then we also, on the digital side, turning the newsroom into a digital newsroom, you know, took us from 20 million uniques to 120 million. Mm. And integrating with the local papers, it's fantastic. Well, let me take you back in time. Let's go, let's do the Market Watch story. Um, where does the idea come from? And, and also why? Is it just timing because the web is, is suddenly taking off? Or how do you get, how does So I'm, I told you about how I learned about what was happening to Sport Tracks, partly because of what happened to Quotrek, uh -huh. right? Yeah. That company, which owned Quotrek, at a very early stage of, of um, Data Sport, which was the name of my company that they were part owners sure. of, they just came to us and said, look, why don't we just buy this thing from you guys? You know, on paper you're making money, but you have no cash. Uh -huh. You know, and which was true. And one lesson I learned was get more cash than you ever think you need if you're doing it. The other lesson was, don't get it from your friends and family. <laughs> it's another story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I did. Yeah. That was the only place I knew that. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they. I watched what was happening, and they said, "Look, we're going to buy. We want to buy your company." And since it's worth more to us than anybody, it's on our network. It's just going to be a, it'll be additional profits for us. We have none of the costs and all of the profits. Um, and we want you to stay, to me, you and my, my partner to stay. He, he was going to become actually president of their company. He had, remember, he had come from mm -hmm. that company. Yeah, right. So he'd go back to be president. And I would stay, first he went back to be vice president. And I would stay as vice president of news for the whole company. And they said, look, we, we're, we're, this was now early 90s and, and the word of the internet was getting out and they were saying you know we're worried we have this monopoly market for the quote track on information on on stock quotes yeah. mm -hmm. and they said and, and and they were smart enough to realize that the there's there's no um it's a commodity mm. the stock quote's a commodity a real-time stock quote there is no like interpretation it's, it's just know, two dollars and seven eighths at at that moment and, and the fat and what the audio, all the customer wants is that delivered as cheaply and as best as possible. So if there became a new way to deliver it besides this incredible FM sideband network they had built, which had become a barrier because nobody wanted to go to 50 cities, find 50 radio stations, you know, do all the and create the dig, the electronic, you know, the the equipment that they mm -hmm. had to develop on their own. They had patents for, um, and they said so. We think we got to do. We're worried about what's going to happen to us. We want you to be VP of news, run the sports thing, but also help us build some, build something that differentiates us. And I said, it's easy. You need to, this was when Bloomberg was starting. I said, you need a news operation. Mm. So if people are going to give up your quotes, they're going to give up your news too. And otherwise it's just going to be about price. If they have a portable device, if that pager comes along and can give it to them in real time and they charge less than you, you're done. Yeah. So you want something more? Let me start to build a newsroom that, and and the way I built it was, I'll start with the most traded stocks you have, your audience has, and I'll cover those. So I'll bring in reporters to cover at that point the internet industry, okay. which was really being traded like crazy. Those are the hot stocks, right? The hot stocks that were being traded because I knew who covered them for the Journal and for you know the uh, for um, Reuters and Dow Jones. It was one person on every beat. So there'd be an electronics reporter or an internet reporter for the journal. There'd be one for the. So I knew that if I just got a good reporter, I'm one on one with them. Mm -hmm. I could be as good as they were, and they were charging a lot of money. Mm. They were uh, in the digital side. It was all about the terminals. So for two thousand a month, you got Bloomberg and you got his news. Nobody knew how much the news was worth, right. but it came with the terminal. Dow Jones, you got the Dow Jones Newswire. Right. Reuters, Reuters terminal. You're paying two thousand a month for all those things. Said, so, and I watched as this generation of day traders was starting to come up 
who didn't use anybody and were sitting at home on their computer because Schwab and all these guys were giving him the ability to trade right there at $4 a trade instead of the $39 they were paying the broker at Merrill Lynch who they didn't trust anyway. And I said, so I can replicate what's great about the stocks they care about for free mm. on the web, you know, for, for give me five people or 10 people and I can build a newsroom that gives them their version of of the Reuters, Dow Jones, and Bloomberg terminal. And Bloomberg can't. Right. Because if Bloomberg gives it to him free, the guy paying $2,000 is going say, excuse me, you know, what's going on? So they were actually, the three guys who did it well were trapped uh -huh. in, in their business. With tra you always want to be trapped in a business like that. I mean, they're making good money. They couldn't go to a broad audience. Let me, I, I, I spoke with Mike Levy of, of Sportsline. Yeah, Mike. And I asked him a similar question, which is, um, you know, you're trying to build a brand against these huge entrenched brands. So how much of an advantage was it that you had this space where everything else is expensive and you've learned this lesson to come in? Monster was the reason we succeeded, I right. think. Right, yeah. You know, and, and... Because even when the Wall Street Journal does go on the web, they're famously uh, paywall. Right. So you, you, you have this protected niche that's gifted to you. And, and I, even within the web, I kept it. When web, aver you know, in 2000, when web advertising crashed, you know, I'll, I'll never forget this. It's kind of ironic now, um, but the, our biggest competitor was thestreet.com. Right. And Jim and I had become friends, and we had been, done a bunch of internet conferences it's, together. Uh, it was always Kramer v. Kramer. Jim Kramer, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and and I, ironic. The irony is, I'm there now. Yeah, right. right. I'm running his company. Yeah. Um, and Jim and I were. I, there was a date around the time of the crash. It was April or May when we did a conference together, and he said. He said, what are you going to do? I mean, our stocks had just gone from like, you know, 100 to 2. Yeah. And he said, I said, well, I believe in internet advertising. I think the idiocy of the companies that, have, were, that were funded over the last year or two caused this crash. I mean, no matter what you were going to do, you know, the dog in the sock wasn't going to be a company. Or Webvan was, was like overbuilt and all mm -hmm. kinds of, th there were just problems with every one of them. They had too much money, they were flush in money and they spent it stupidly. Mm -hmm. A lot of it on advertising. I said, I believe real advertising though, we'll go to the web, we'll be, be able to support our audience. And he goes, I don't. Mm -hmm. And he said, we're going to start charging. And they started charging for content at his, and advice at the street. Not exactly the same, but similar, right? Yeah. And um, you know, I, I think timing being everything, you know, his decision and my decision those days was the difference between me getting half a billion dollars for that company five years later and, and the street still struggling in mm -hmm. its own way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's there, it's a business, but it's not a big business mm -hmm. and we got to get it, we still have to get it there. And, um, and it was because, you know, there are, there are, there are symptoms about going behind a paywall that make it. You, you know, there are problems. You have to have a big enough audience to do it. So one of the great examples was we, there was a guy who worked for both the street and, and market watch at different times, Herb Greenberg. Uh, right. He's a really great, you know, stock picker from California. Yeah. So San Diego. He was always big on, on, de on um, shorts. Mm -hmm. He would go into companies and expose them and right. stuff, say these guys, they don't know what they're talking about, whatever. And there was a moment in time when the street he went back and forth two or three times the street, between us and the street. The street always wanted him to be a pay product, a high-end pay product for like hedge funds. And he, they could get like five or ten grand to subscribe to his product as long as he wasn't available for free, right? So they were making pretty good money on his product. But after about six months, all of his sources dried up because they never saw him. They never read him. I mean, the sources weren't the ten thousand yeah. dollar people. The sources were different, and he couldn't get him to answer his phone. He could. They didn't realize he was still writing. I mean, it was like a dilemma. And then he'd come back to us and write, you know, and just for the free site. <laughs> and it was it's, like, if you're not part of the conversation, then suddenly you're not valuable to yeah, people. Yeah, it's you're kind not of in the, the conversation. Right. You better be. You better matter a lot, and you better. And if you're a, a, a you know. Dow Jones gets information even though they sell high-end products because they still have a thousand people out there and they still have a newspaper and they have all these other, the prestige of the journal is great, but the hedge fund guy isn't going to live or die in the journal. He's got to know from the insider products what's going on in the industry. He's trading, you know, minute to minute. So it, but they had, so they, there, there is a value, understanding the real value to your customers, back to that original point, 
is it was really critical. Um, but the opening that you talked about, the the gee, nobody's doing this for free, and there's going to be a whole generation of people who are going to trade who are never going to spend two thousand dollars for a month for a terminal anymore, and they're not going to call a broker anymore. And those people need something. I mean, it's kind of like I could do something for them that couldn't have been done for them two years earlier. It's like Uber, you know. The, yeah. The, there's a service that 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 really gets them what they need, and they, and they were religious zealots about it. Our users were like depend, so dependent on it, and still are today. I mean, I, I, the number of people I run into is that Mark, which I still use yeah, every yeah. day. You know. <laughs> yeah. um, let me. Uh, it's it, it's famously CBS Market Watch in the 90s. And so since this reminds me, there's, there's rhymes here with your strategy with the sporting news. Yep. How, uh, again, um, explain to me the relationship with CBS because then again, it's, it's building off a brand for free. Oh, it's also critical to the success. Uh -huh. So when I started the business at DBC, um, Data Broadcasting Corp, I, it actually started, incubated it as DBC Online. I didn't have CBS or anything like that. And when I saw the mass numbers coming in, we had a million uniques as DBC Online in 97. And Barron's had done a story about the best business websites, and we had gotten notoriety from that. We were the number one site. Nobody ever heard of us in New York. And, but there was this, the, all the internet traders knew who we were. But the New Yorkers started to pick up who we were. So I said, I went back to my bosses at DBC who had let me build this thing. And, and I said, all right, I'm going to make you a deal. I want to, I think this thing is going to be a, a, a huge business, but I got to get a media partner. It's going to be advertising based and we don't have the branding and I need to get a media partner in and I, I don't even need their money. I just need the brand. We have to give away, we have to spin this thing out. And everybody's overvaluing internet companies, so I could get this will be good for you guys. Mm -hmm. We'll get it, and, and our company will be worth as much as your company. And, and, and they're getting it cheap, right? And and it's but but we'll be if I get the right brand, it'll be you know we'll be uh, it'll cut ten years off of what we have uh, our ability to sell advertising and get news and break news. And they and he said, well, what do you want? I said, I want to be able to. I want to, your promise. A handshake's good enough with me to say that I'll, you'll let me spin this company out, you'll carve out X number percentage points for me and the staff from, as CEO, I yeah. want to be CEO of it, um, and you and the other partner will own, who I bring in, will own each own half of the remaining shares, 45% of the company, right. it was 10%. And they said, okay, fine. You know, they didn't know it was gonna happen, really. First place I went to was CNBC, and cause FNN, which these guys used to be part of that company, was sold to CNBC right. in a bidding war. And, and, uh, and may, it was the reason CNBC really took off when, they, when there's only one business network at that point. FNN, I think, had been on... Uh, there was an attempt by somebody at Westinghouse to do another news channel, but that failed. So the um, F CNBC guys were really interested. They said, this is cool. You know, we could have a... We could do all kinds of stuff. We could have handheld devices. We could, we, you know, and you guys could do that. But we could, the internet, this internet thing could be great. And they said, uh, so here's the deal. You know, we'll buy it, but, you know, we're going to run it. We're and in I charge. Said, and I said, no, you don't get it. You guys can't do this. Because they don't know the web like you they know. They don't know any, right. Yeah. You guys don't know anything about the web. I mean, the ironic proof of, of concept here was when, you know, 10 years later, Dow Jones bought us yeah. for half a billion dollars. You had a company with 1,600 financial journalists to buy a company with 100 journalists who did essentially the same thing for half a billion dollars. But did it better online. <laughs> online. Just did it better online. So was it worth something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But they didn't get it. And, they wanted, and so I like freaked out at the meeting. I came out of that and said, we can't do this deal. And, and the guys from, C, from um, DBC were like, apoplectic. They said, what do you mean? It's CNBC. They're going to do it. We can sell these. You know, this is going to be great. And mm -hmm. I said, no, it's not going to be great. It's going to like fail. And you don't, and we argued. So I went and took a flyer. I met, I had met Mike Levy. Mm -hmm. Mike had had a similar situation where he'd gone to Fox first. And Fox he thought was going to be his partner. And they sort of back. At the last minute he got nervous about them because they didn't really know what they were doing. And he turned around and went to CBS. And, and he had made a deal with CBS, a stock deal where CBS took a big chunk of his company for stock mm -hmm. and, and an ongoing deal to get more stock every year if they gave him more 
promotion. Right, because they're giving promotion in exchange for this. Right, equity, that's yeah. what they're doing. They're giving fifty. So I w he said, "I'll introduce you to the CBS guys." Mm -hmm. I said, "Great," and he did. And I went to see him in New York. And who's that? It was the time was a guy named Derek Ricefield. The CEO of, of CBS then was a guy named Michael Jordan. It was owned by Westinghouse and owned it, and they were it, they actually were selling it to Viacom at the time. And but Michael Jordan was the CEO, um, and he was. He sent two people out. He sent um, Derek Ricefield, who was his, his right-hand guy to do these kind of things, and uh, Betsy Morgan, who was, at the time, a newly hired MBA from Harvard at CBS. And that's where I met Betsy, and I, we became great friends later. But, uh, and I went out and pitched them on the idea, and they loved it. So they went back to New York and they called me up and said, you got to come to New York and you got to meet with Andrew Hayward, who's the president of CBS News, because this essentially is a CBS News deal. You'd become part of CBS News. Right, and, and CBS doesn't, because NBC has CNBC, CNBC but... CBS had not, yeah. CBS's coverage of financial news was one guy named Ray Brady, who was 70 years old and did it for both CBS TV and radio. Mm. They had and and the business story was becoming the biggest story of the decade in the nineties, right? In the nineties, yeah, right? Sure. And it's they got this guy and they're up against CNBC and everything going on, Bloomberg, yeah. all this shit, yeah. right? So I, I I get ready for this meeting with Andrew and I'm trying to think how's this going to go? Because I'm basically to say, look, why don't you let us cover financial news for you? Of course, you're not covering it, right? right? And. And I'm thinking now, back to my Washington Post days, you know, what if somebody had come into the Washington Post and say, why don't we just cover business for you? Right. You know, the window wouldn't have been big enough to like <laughs> throw them out of. You'd be insulted, right? Yeah. And I'm going, oh fuck, this is gonna be bad. And I said, but I, I'm a nice guy, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna really try to build a relationship with Andrew. And we had mutual friends, we'd been at Harvard at the same time, but I'd been in grad school, he'd been an undergraduate, and we had some mutual friends, we didn't know each other at all. The meeting was fantastic, mm. and it was all of my journalists were guys I'd hired from, you know, Reuters, Bloomberg, uh, Dow Jones. They were legit. They weren't like internet kids. So he could see I had a staff of like 15 or 20 at the time, but they were all legit journalists. And I said, and I told him what we're doing. I said, I'd be willing to go out and hire TV people. What I want from you is branding all over CBS News. You know, CBS, we want to call it CBS Market Watch. I said, can I, I wanted to use, um, I, want a, I want a TV show on the weekends, like a personal finance thing that I'll, I'll hire everybody for, I'll hire the talent for. But I said, before I hire talent, I'll clear them with you. I'll find people I think would be great, but I, I want you to think that they're worthy of CBS News. And if they are, then you can use them all week, free, for your evening broadcast, for anything on Wall Street reports or whatever. But I'll pay for them, you can have them. Um, and, and I won't hire anybody you don't want me to hire to make mm. sure that they're okay. And he, we're going through this and he goes, it, it goes on for about 30 minutes and I'm waiting for like, okay, what's he gonna say, you know? He's being very patient. And he gets to the end of it, he goes, we need this so badly, I can't begin to tell you. I've had to cut costs for blank and blank. And he goes, this would be gold. This would be fantastic. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> he said, how quickly can we get this thing done? And I was like, oh my God. And then, I, you know, then he put, handed me off to Fred Reynolds, who was the CFO of CBS and a shark, uh -huh. which took about four months to negotiate without me mm -hmm. killing him. <laughs> um, but we make the deal. And the deal is they're going to get uh, effectively 50% of the company, but then 10% is going to be carved off for the boys. So DBC and there as 50-50 owners, right? 45% owners. Right. owners. They're going to get... Um, uh, they're gonna they're gonna give us for that stock they're gonna give us no cash and fifty million dollars worth of promotion and advertising on the CBS television network or any of their products. Which for example would turn out to be every night Dan Rather says the CBS Whenever when, when when our logo went up behind him, yeah. they cha ching yeah. that was a ten second commercial. So they were double dipping. Yeah. They were getting commercial out of editorial time. They didn't even have to cut into their commercial time. I mean, it was like, but I didn't care. And, and we got the weekend show, mm. right? They gave us that. And they, um, although that wasn't in the contract, I had to be, that was just a handshake, we'll try. Um, they owned the syndication wing, that's who I dealt with there. I had to sell it myself to them, but that was okay. Uh, and we got, um, 
uh, we, we, we got the ability to license for the first time outside of Sportsline the CBS brand. So we could call the product CBS uh, Market Watch. The company was marketwatch.com. We didn't want to have CBS the name in the company. They didn't want to give it to us. Mm -hmm. But we, we had the right to use, C for the purposes of a financial news, blah, blah, all very tightly defined, we had the right to put the CBS brand on our product. This is like the only time in history outside of Sportsline where that was allowed, right? And man, let me tell you, that's no easy task. There are four people in New York who do nothing but monitor use of the eye. Mm. So when the eye police call you, you know, it's like, <laughs> green, we can't do green. We, we have to do green. We have to fight with like, you know, designers yeah. in Milan over the ability to like, don't have the blind blink. That, you can't do that. It's like, what are you? Um, all kinds of stuff like that. But, but they did grant it. And Andrew, and, and we built these, we could take, um, besides the clicking of, Behind Dan Rather, we were able to get things like billboards because they owned a billboard business. And then we would do things like put these billboards around every advertising agency in New York, outside of them, you know, and, and you know, cleverly target that. We had CBS Radio, wasn't part of the deal, but they agreed they would, t we would do a... And it was the Market Watch <laughs> Report. 20, every, it, was, they, it was Westwood One, which they controlled. And we said, we want to do a radio thing. And they said, oh, we could do that. We need a financial one. And we were on a thousand stations. We had, and so I used to go in to meet with advertisers. I remember going into Fidelity once, and I went around the room and said, you know, how do you guys use Market Watch? And one guy had heard the radio report, one guy had seen the billboard, a woman had, you know, watched the TV show over the weekend. I mean, we were, everything was hitting. I mean, it was all part of the brand. <clears throat> we had built a company, a huge brand on a very small, with a very small amount of money and platform. So effectively, we rented a brand. And, and at the same time, the street was spending over a hundred million dollars over four or five years to build its brand mm -hmm. of the street, which it, was a great brand, but it took a long time to build. It's faster to piggyback. It was incredibly fast. Plus, from the minute we made the deal, all of our reporters and all of our ad sales, we got their calls answered. And they just assumed it was CBS. Mm. And it was part of CBS. So journalistically, we were, our credibility went like that. Our advertisers' credibility went like that. It was, you know, a monster thing to do. So my philosophy on it was, and here's where Mike and I differed a little. I said, we're going to be, to the CBS guys, we're going to be your best partner, no matter what. And I did some things that I had to get my board to agree to that, you know, you could have argued they should have paid us for, or, but I just did them. I wanted them to think of us as... You know, we were really good, but we were there to Best help them. Best friend, yeah. This was about helping you. Any relationship and every negotiation I've learned in my life, the magic of making that happen is to understand exactly what the other guy wants from you and make sure they're getting it. You'll get what you want if they get what they want. Yeah. You don't, if you go into a try and sell an ad because, oh my God, I got to hit my quota, they're going to look at you like, yeah, that's great. But if you go in and say, you know, you guys have trouble with millennials and I can reach, you know, a million of them tomorrow, and then there's listening. Right, it's their problems, not yours. So we built it, and the uh, built the relationship with them. And I could see that over time, that fifty million in advertising was going to run out. And how are we going to handle that? So I wanted to do a secondary after we went public, which was you know that reduced going public reduced them to like thirty five percent each. The two. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you oh, because okay. we've got about fifteen minutes left, and I don't want Deborah to be mad at me. <laughs> so I want you to. I'd be remiss if I didn't hit these two points. And so they kind of bleed into each other. Yeah. You go public in 99, which is the height of the bubble. So if you could tell that story. And then my secondary question would be surviving the bust. Yeah. So let's run all that together. So yeah. Great. Tell, tell me about the IPO in 99. The IPO was insanity. So it was um, uh, in the fall of 99, banks were lining up to take us public. We had been a, a company for, uh, for, I'm sorry, fall of 98. We, we'd been a company from October of 97 on. We had, you know, 7 million in sales by the fall of 98. And we were break even. Mm -hmm. And banks were coming to us saying, you got to go public. Because we had a couple million unique users, which was a big deal at the time. And the... Uh, you have like 7 million in revenue and only 35 employees at this yes, point. Yes, that's think. right. Okay. In a, and, and in one office in you know, in, a, in a, the basement of the CBS, of a building in... But this is a time when seven million in revenue... It was revenue. Right. And half of these companies were going public with no revenue. Right, right, yeah. But we were, so 
the market had been hot, hot, but was getting cold. It was around Thanksgiving. So we made a decision that we would go in January. We put off the decisions and don't try and do this in the holidays. We'll go in the first week of January. We'll be the first guys out in 99. Mm-hmm. And, and hopefully the climate will change because the climate had gotten a little, gone a little south. Uh, and um, th- we were hot as hell. We were going like great gangbusters. We were getting unique users like crazy. The market was hot. And uh, so on January 3rd, I think it was, we hit the road. Mm-hmm. We go out with DLJ. For the road show. R- for the road yeah. show. DLJ and um, uh, uh, BT Alex Brown, right? Later Deutsche Bank. Mm-hmm. But they, uh, and they take us to these, and we decide we're going to go, at, we're going to raise 20, 25 million or so. We're going to sell 10% of the company. So it's, uh, or not 10, but about, uh, let me see, we, it was about 15% of the company. But it was at a market cap of like, you know, a hundred and something million. And if we, if we do it, that's what, that was what we were targeting. We we're going to raise like 20 something million, 27 million. And we're going to charge 10 to $12 a share. Mm. Um, so we go out the first week and every account we visited were drooling for the stock. They wanted they, every single one asked for the most shares they could get. They said, whatever you'll give us, we'll take. And so by the end of the first week, the bankers are hearing this and they're like, we're having these conferences going, and they're going, what's going on on the roadshow? What are you saying to these people, mm. you know? And they're with us, their bankers are with us. And they said, man, I'm telling you, they just, they would warm us up for a meeting by saying, look, this woman who runs this fund is just a savage beast. She's gonna come in, she's gonna be friendly for about five minutes, she's gonna rip your fucking throat out. And she's gonna take your heart and stomp on it in front of you and she's gonna insult you just don't take the bait. Be cool. It was a love fest. You walked in and they said, this is the coolest thing. We love it. How, you know, and they'd ask these softball questions. And I'm going like, oh, my God. So at the end of the first week, we huddle up and we say, what do we do? We've got institutional orders for 50 million shares at that point. So you're way oversubscribed. Yeah, we're selling 2.7 million yeah. shares, right? Yeah. And I'm going, what the fuck? And they said, no, you got to keep going here. you got to do the rest. They said, well, maybe we could raise the price a little bit. Yeah. They said, okay, so we'll go from 10 to 12 to 12 to 14. And that means we have to go back to everybody who's ordered and say, are you still in? They did that. Everybody stayed in. The second week, the same thing happened. Now we're in other cities. We're in New York and we're in L.A. And I mean... Everybody, it was the total, absolute love. This is the closest I will ever feel to being a rock star. Mm. Going through this thing where they wanted everything we said they were just eating up. And I was with my CFO and I, and I'm, I'm like obviously the passionate guy who, who's built the business, but he's there to be responsible. And, and what did he say? Think Yiddish, look British. He was, that was his shtick. And he, and he was great. And, and it was all good. And so we get to the end of the second week. Now we have institutional orders for over 100 million shares. And they want me to go to Europe. And I said, it's, it's January 14th, and we're in San Francisco at the DLJ Internet Conference, which uh-huh. was very close to the height of the moment, uh-huh. right? And so we're there, and I'm making a speech there. I'm going to deliver by my um, shtick in front of 200 people instead of the small rooms of 10. I'm, they're, they're actually letting me do my, my um, IPO roadshow in front of the whole conference. And CBS is coming out. They haven't seen it. Everybody's coming out for this thing. And the only way they let, at that point, it was Mel Carmison, see it was in a big room because he takes over any room he's in otherwise. Mm. So we want him to see the whole presentation. So I go and do this thing. And it was a, it was a massive home run. And we meet, all the bankers are there at this conference. We meet with the CBS guys and the data broadcasting guys. And we all get together and decide. And I say, look, you know, we got to go. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to Europe. Let's just go tomorrow. And, and how high can we set the price? I'm saying, why don't we like set it at 35? I mean, this is ridiculous. And they all explained to me how you can't do that. You have to have a valuation. You have to have a reason why it's, or you're going to be sued for mm-hmm. Pumping and dumping, essentially. Right. And and I said, well, okay, what's the highest you'll do? And they all kind of huddled, and they they're calling their desks in New York, and they're asking them about comps, and they finally come back with seventeen dollars a share. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, we're seventeen dollars a share. We're going to go pop the champagne cork. They go around the room first of all, and they ask everybody who's matters, the DBC guys who are the big owners and CBS. 
the ABC guys do this big speech about, oh, they're so proud of this thing they built, and it's about them. You get to CBS and everybody's waiting because Mel Carmazon is the darling of Wall Street at that point, right? And everybody waits for what Mel's going to say. And Mel goes, you know, Larry got us here. This is all, this is his business. He's done a great job. I, I go with whatever he says. And I'm like, <laughs> it gets to me and I said, well, I think we should go I, and go right now. And, and everybody agrees and because, you know, uh, Mel said it Signed too. Off, yeah. And, and so we, we, we say, okay, we're going tomorrow. We're going to do it. Ten minutes later, I see Mel as we go to the elevators, and I said, "Mel, I'll never forget that." I, yeah. I was in tears. I mean, it was—I'm a young CEO. I don't have any experience. And he goes, "Hey, pal, this thing goes south. It's your ass. <laughs> Doors close." And I'm like, <laughs> "It's like a movie." Yeah. It, just, it was like a movie scene. Yeah. So okay, we go the next day. I'm at the office at uh, at our offices where we have our terminals set up, and we have real time quotes on some of our terminals. Right. And, and time in sales. Time in sales shows you each trade as it goes across. Mm -hmm. You can put time in sales up just for one stock if you want and see every trade. So we put it up for our ticker. Nothing happens for hours. So we're, I'm there at 6.30, market open. It's now 10.30, 11.30. Nothing's traded. I call NASDAQ and say, what's going on? They say, well, we have an order imbalance. Everybody wants to buy it. Nobody wants to sell. So what the hell are you going to do? And they said, well, we're going to get some buyers. We're going out and talking to people. And we're talking to sellers, I mean. We're going to talk to some of the funds about selling. At 3.30 in the afternoon, the first trade comes across at 65. And, and it, it was priced at 17. 17. Mm -hmm. uh, and then something I'd never, ever seen happen happened. That, that time and sales line became a blur. You could not read anything. It was going too fast. Right? It was just literally a blur of stuff going by. It went over the half the last half hour of trading, which is all it was open. Twelve thousand shares, twelve million shares traded. We only were trading two point seven. Remember, that means every share traded five or six times. Yeah, yeah. It went to one hundred and thirty, and it settled at ninety seven. It closed that day at ninety seven which made us a billion dollar market cap company. And you were going out at like 100 million or 200 million? 100 million. Yeah. And we had 7 million in sales and no profit, yeah, yeah. right? The, all of the funds that had bought, you know, and they all got allocated small allocations because we gave it to everybody. Every one of them was out because they were all mid cap, and, I mean uh, micro cap and, and small cap funds. When it hit a billion, they had to sell. Right. They're not allowed to keep a stock that's right. a billion dollar market cap or more. Yeah. They all made seven times their money that first day, every single one of them. So the thing goes out. It's at a hundred. It's at a hundred bucks a share, roughly ninety to hundred bucks a share. Nope, none of us can trade. Sixteen of the thirty people in the room are of the thirty-five people are millionaires on paper now. None of us had any money before that, really. And I call the staff together and say, you know, if I hear any of you borrowing against these options because we couldn't trade for six months, I'll fire you. And they all kind of laughed and said, you know, why would you do that? And I said, because you're an idiot. And you don't have unions. I can fire you if I think you're an idiot. And if you do this, you, you, you're going to get in trouble. And, you know, sure enough, that was happening then. People were buying against things and, you know, buying Mercedes and houses by bar Banks would loan them money against the value of their options. And then they disappeared. And then they had to, everything got recalled. Nobody in the staff did. It was great. They all stayed in. Um, and we held up for a year, from January of 99 till April of 2000, May, March or April of 2000. We, were, we stayed, we were in the 80s and mm -hmm. 90s. Um, and I bought a company, I bought Big Charts, which was mm -hmm. this great company. They had two million in sales and they wanted 150 million. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll give it to you in stock. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they took it. We yeah. gave them like five million in cash or three million in cash and the rest in stock, thank God. Um, which gets to how we survive. Well, listen, I, we're at time right now. I, you can go as long as you want, but I'm telling you that we're at time right now. Okay. So I'll just do the stock thing. You could use it or not, right? Can yeah. you cut? Oh, I don't cut anything. This is for history. Okay. But tell me, okay, so tell me. As, that was how we survived. How you survived in, in as much, yeah, as you're willing so to do. So Big Charts was a, a digital, um, uh, they, they were a, Li they licensed charts to a bunch of sites. Mm -hmm. So they did, they were all investor, young investors. I remember them, yes. They were great. Yeah. And, and I needed to get out from under DBC's technology group. 
Because remember, even though I was a separate company, I was licensing, I was using their technology. I needed my own tech room. We're a real public company now. We had to do all that. And I was trying to build one, but it was a nightmare trying to build one. And these guys came to us and we learned about them. I went to see them. I said, could you run our whole business? And they said, well, yeah, we could. I said, okay, I want to buy you guys. And why don't you join us? It's going to be a great ride, blah, blah. They said, oh, we want 150 million. I said, I'll give it to you in stock. And they said, what? I said, and, and they were too dumb to know what was going to happen to the stock. We all were. Mm -hmm. But Oh, I guessed it. <laughs> they, they, so we made the deal. And they brought, they were great. They became our underpinning, but they also gave us this licensing business where instead of just selling advertising, which is our entire thing, we were now selling um, uh, companies, uh, white labeling, all the it's charting and stuff. And all these companies were building sites, brokerages, other news organizations. In fact, one of my first customers was USA Today, where they thought they were going to build a pay site then. And we gave them, we said, we'll do your stock pages. We called it brand labeled quotes. And we did their stock pages that looked just like you're on USA Today, but it was on our site. And, and we, we said, so you could go back and you'd click back and forth. People would click on things. They didn't actually have URLs then. You clicked on the buttons that brought you to a site and to a page, but you had no way of knowing if that page was on or off the site you were on. But it, so it looked like you were on it and they'd pay us a fee and we'd get it. Next year comes around, and then we're building that business nicely. The year that advertising crashed, and we went from 33 million to 16 million annually, one year, um, that business went from 10 to 25 million. Was there a real moment in time when the advertising, like one week it's going like dot com it, great? It was and then March. The it started to drop off in March, and things started to happen. The panic started to happen in, by March and April. Yeah. And the the te most telling view of it was the industry standard, which was the time the big magazine, right? Mm -hmm. Industry standard in 1999 was the single most successful magazine in the history of the United States in selling ads. In terms of it, ad pages ad per page, issue, yeah. It looked, and it looked like Vogue. It yeah. became weekly, yeah. and it looked like Vogue. I mean, it was that thick. Mm -hmm. And in, by um, two or three months after April of 99, it was gone. Yeah out, over. Mattel had just surrendered. I mean, he had built buildings, he had done the whole thing, and it was like, are you fucking kidding me? It is gone. Mm. So the panic started happening in March and April, but it, by the end of April, nobody was in there. And it was really a combination of a couple things, though. It was, nobody really understood the effectiveness yet of internet advertising, but so much of the internet advertising was being spent by companies who had raised stupid money and advertising their idea that was a bad idea, from Pets.com to Webvan mm -hmm. to all these ideas. And you just go through pages and pages and say, is this, how could this thing ever become a company? Right. And they didn't. And so when they stop being a company, they, the stop ads advertising. go away. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so because of big charts, while this is happening, you have this other revenue stream that's still growing into this. Right. And so our year looked flat. Mm. It went, we went from 10 to 25 in there, and down, up 15 and down 15. So we, in the worst year in the internet, you know, we were a company that had flat revenues. And the stock was doing, you know, the, the company was performing fine. Our advertising, even though, you know, it had gone off there, we, we still, we could support what we had. We, we did do some layoffs, we did do a bunch of things, but we, we never missed a quarter mm. in our reporting. And so as a public company, I called everybody together again when it really hit, and I said, okay, Biggest problem I had were all the options were in the 80s. Of course, we'd hired so many people after we went public, and now the stock was like two. Every internet stock went between one right. and three, including Yahoo yeah. and everybody. And Amazon went down to five. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we said, we called everybody together, and I said, and I, I went to the SEC, and I said, I'd like to be able to reissue options. I know that there's rules around this, but whatever you tell me the rules are, I'll follow them. And they said, okay, here's what to do people have to surrender their existing options. You can replace them with them. In fact, I would replace them with, they said, three quarters of what the actual number was the first time around. So it's not exactly the same number. You're giving them a little bit less, and you start the clock over. So it, they, they have to earn them again. And I said, wow. And they said, you know, what are they going to be worth otherwise? Yeah. Right? And they're going to be sitting on your books, and they're ridiculous. They're not part of your... And you're, I said, you're right. So I went back, and you, and you said, you had to give people the option of doing it. So, and we had people who had gotten everything from 
ninety dollars down to like eleven or fourteen dollars, and and that, that because they had gotten it on the way down, they were fairly recent hires, and and it was over about a three week period that it dropped from like the sixties to nothing, and the, and I thank God just closed a, a round. I did my secondary round with CBS. When I said to CBS, I got to get some cash out of you guys. You got to yeah. give me some cash. Yeah. And I didn't get to tell you the story of how, you know, because I was a good guy, how we found another way to have keep have them keep promoting us without charging us. That I was agreed to buy some more of that, but it had to end after a certain mm -hmm, period of time. Mm -hmm. And I did it on a handshake with Andrew. And they could have violated it and said, no, we're cutting you off, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And it was the opposite of what happened to Mike Levy, who negotiated every penny down and lost the company mm -hmm. to it because he had to give him so much stock. It, it's a long story. But anyway, his, it, it was, um, uh, now I've, I've lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. So um, the, the, all the employees uh, reprice. Right, they reprice. So most of the employees asked to reprice, uh -huh. surrendered their options. Right. Some people in the $11, $12 range kept them, mm. right? There were some early employees too, before we went up before it, it went through the roof, you know, who, I mean, before it um, crashed, I mean, who had it on the way down. Uh, and the, and I said, to, I called everybody together and said, that's fine, we just will reprice the people who give it to us, the people who want to keep their options can. Um, but this is how it's supposed to work. You're not supposed to become a millionaire overnight. And the company's doing fine, and it's going to take a few years, but you'll see this go up. So we were at $2 a share then, buck fifty, And... Over the next five years, it went up. It was at 12, 10 or 12. Uh, again, we issued a lot more shares, too, so the market cap was up higher. It was maybe a couple hundred million. And uh, the, um, and the, but the people who had gotten their new options, they'd gotten a lot of them. It was still, hot. they were from the early days. Started to see them really starting to grow. And, uh, Dow Jones came along and decided they had to own this thing. And they made a decision because they had figured out that even though they were charging and doing well with all that, that they were mortgaging their future. That the research they were doing showed them that young college students and self-directed, um, how they call them, self-directed investors, internet traders, yeah. when they asked where they got their financial information from, were saying market watch because it was, they didn't need Dow Jones. So they were worried they were going to lose the feeder. Well, and again, your free model works out because they, they've already got the pay, but they realize they also need to be in the free game. Right. Yeah. So they're, they're, so they're, for, they're deciding, do we, do we build it or do we buy these guys? And they had tried to build it two or three times and failed. They actually had a, a site called Dow Jones Online that was free, but it always wasn't as good. They deliberately would like have the news would be 15 minutes delayed or something. All you gotta do is tell somebody on the web, I'm giving you a 15 minute delayed. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, yeah, that's like, be stupid, read this. <laughs> you know, so people can trade ahead of you, yeah. you know? They didn't understand, again, from the consumer point of view, it was worthless, even though it was 15 minutes early. It was, that's why it was worthless. So they, they decided they had to have us and we, um, I didn't want to be on the block because we had $50 million in the bank. We were in really good shape and we could go on for a long, long time and we were growing. I said, I mean, you have to make a really good deal for us. And we had this market cap of worth like $250 million. And uh, so I, I didn't know what they'd be willing to pay and all that stuff. So I hired a banker for the company, a guy named Jeff Sign, who was at UBS at the time. And Jeff came in and advised us all that he didn't recommend doing a public auction because if you don't sell you look bad and and you don't want to be for and things bad things happen to you when you're for sale he said you don't have to be for sale so he goes but i'll here's what we should do i don't want to give it to them i just don't want to negotiate only with them i want to hit up privately hit like four or five potential buyers you tell me who the best possible buyers might be and i want to approach all of them because i know that he knew everybody in media i'll know them and i can ask them you know politely and quietly are you interested and he went to um, Yahoo, the New York Times, uh, Gannett, uh, and um, of course we had to go to our two shareholders at the time, CBS and Pearson, which had bought Dead a Broadcasting Company because mm -hmm. they wanted half of Market Watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had bought the whole parent company, mm -hmm. right? The original company. Uh, they owned the FT at the time, right? Right. And the and so we asked. So he said, "We'll, we'll ask them." And uh, and then there's Dow Jones, right? 
and we'll see what, um, and, and we'll see if there's other interest. Everybody wanted in. Everybody cared, thought they would love it, except Pearson. Pearson was going through huge trouble with FT.com at that point. And we had done FT Market Watch. We'd started it, it was a huge success, and then they folded it right at the crash. And we, a huge success in terms of getting an audience. Yeah. They, and so they did it, they started going out, and we effectively got a bidding war going. Between, it ultimately was between um, uh, Dow Jones and CBS. And, you know, CBS lost, but it was in losing, you know, they got 150 million for the, you know, 13 million they put in mm -hmm. in the secondary, mm -hmm. whatever it mm -hmm. was. And it was so it's a great way to lose, um, but they but it was a it, you know we were able we got the price up doubled the price I mean they you got they negotiated the price up to eighteen dollars in four or five different rounds. Well, and you want to sell to them because you realize they're if you don't they're going to be competing with you. So life well, that's part of it. Also, there it's worth more to them than anybody because well, the media companies all understood the advertising business. Dow Jones was the only one that really understood the licensing business, mm. which was half our revenue at that mm -hmm. point. It was I mean, the the we were at we were probably at fifty million not half we were at fifty million in advertising then and 35, 30 million in well maybe thirty five million in licensing, the big charts business. So it was, uh, and so they were so for everybody else that thirty five was like I don't, I don't know what to do with that, but Dow Jones actually had a business where they licensed yeah. lots of financial yeah. stuff, yeah. so it was. But so it, it works out for your investors, it works out for the employees that have repriced the, everybody's... Everybody got... Yeah. I mean, for me, it's funny. The irony was, it, it was five years later, uh, what am I saying, six or seven years after the IPO, and the dollar amount I would have gotten if I'd be paid out the day of the IPO for everything I had was about what I got. Yeah. Well... <laughs> <laughs> you was, can't. You can't I mean, do better than that. Yeah. You know, it was seven. It took seven more years, yeah. but because I didn't get to sell any of it really yeah. out of the IPO. Well, listen, I could talk to you for another hour. Um, uh, there was a great story about when Yahoo turns on the fire hose for you and stuff. Let me. Yeah. Let me. Let, yeah. Final question. Other people like to ask, "Where's the future of media going?" I'm focused on history, so I have an interesting history question. Mm -hmm. We live in this world of entrepreneurial culture and the cult of the entrepreneur. You covered business in the 70s and the 80s. From your experience, what was the difference? I feel like in, the, in those days there wasn't this cult of the entrepreneur. So covering business news 20, 30, 40 years ago versus today, what's the difference? It was starting then. Mm -hmm. The cult of the entrepreneur was starting in the West Coast then. Um, I, I can look at, I have a different perspective on it that might be revealing though. It was at the Harvard Business School. You know, I went, I went to journalism school at Syracuse, and then I went to the Harvard Business School because I wanted to cover business, mm -hmm. and that was what I did right afterwards. But the the Harvard Business School um, tracked my class for twenty five years, mm -hmm. and tracked it against a class. My class was a class of seventy four. They tracked it against a class twenty five years earlier. No, uh, yeah, the class of 49 mm. was the, well, they tracked similarly, which was one of the greatest classes, quote unquote, in Harvard Business School history. Tons of like corporate giants, you know, the guys who ran Xerox, mm. IBM, mm. all these corporate guys who'd ri risen up to the top of the corporate world were in that class of 49, mm -hmm. a disproportionate number mm -hmm. of people. So they compared against our class, no particular reason, mm -hmm. and the the shocking difference was, you know, the number of people in our class who owned their own businesses and who didn't go the corporate route and, and in the end made so much more money <laughs> than the class of 49. But they, there was a real, they, they tracked multiple things, not just how much you made, but how you, happy you were with your life, how mm. many times you'd been married and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And clearly this class was a, was had more satisfaction out of their lives and were happier doing what they were doing than any of the guys in the earlier got, one who had gone to the who had made it to the top mm -hmm. so it there was a i watched that happen while i was going through all this stuff i was because they were tracking our class and yeah. i was reading all these things you yeah. know as yeah. every five years they do a, a big study at our reunion and and you know i think the uh i think it was a combination of things including the sort of end of this 50s and 60s 
stability. You know, where the goal was, you know, you worked for a company for 50 years, you had a great pension, you had a life. Till you died, you were covered, soup to nuts. And the world, U.S. protected you. And we lost that starting in the 70s, I think, and late 60s and early 70s, that that was really going to be the case. And people got nervous and scared and started doing things. And then they also found out they could, mm. that they, you know, that being in charge of your own life wasn't all that bad. And, and you know, the things that mattered, even to somebody like me who was living in the early parts of this period where I still wanted, I liked the idea of working for a big company for half of my corporate life. I mean, all the things I could never imagine were the things that were the best things for me later. When I was, you know, I'd risen up in the newspaper world to be a young star. You know, that, that moment where, um, you know, I went from youngest newspaper executive to oldest internet executive with nothing in between right. was an interesting moment for me because I looked back and said, how could that happen? But it was because I really had taken over my life. You know, I'd taken much more control taken over Taken control my life. of your life, yeah. You know, and, and that was... A huge difference and you know your mind opens up a lot more your you know you could say it's partly for fear or for whatever whatever the motivations are in the financial world which I, I mean I live in a lot of this time even as a journalist there are really only two great motivators fear and greed mm. you know people think they're you know in the markets they're either gonna make a lot of money or they better protect their money I mean that's what get, keep, causes them to keep coming back and you could look at I could look, look at the pages of Market Watch and know what kind of day it was. Because when it was when the markets were way up, everybody was looking at their portfolio pages. Because it made them feel better. When the markets were tanking, it was just the news pages. They wouldn't look at the portfolio pages. They'd look at the news pages and go, Why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. And so the psychology it would became a much more of a gambler psychology. You're willing to gamble on everything, including your life, because you had to. There wasn't an easy straight, classy route that took you exactly where you wanted to go, protected you along the way. This utopia that we had kind of designed in the 50, after World War II, mm -hmm. you know, really didn't, really was not a very credible thing. I mean, it could, it couldn't go on the way right. it is. It couldn't sustain itself. And so because it doesn't, it unleashes this creative force out into the world. Right. And I, so you let, we laugh at 1984 and some of the Apple ad and yeah, all those yeah. things, but there was a real feeling there that we were becoming something, you know, not so cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people wanted to be, you know, there was a yearning to be different and to try something different. And there was a belief that you could do anything, you know, which was part of it. And some of the, you know, there's no question that a lot of people got motivated by the fact that huge fortunes were made overnight and it with a good, on a good idea. Mm -hmm. And, but that was, that was a reminder to a lot of people that it could be done, you know, and, and it, a motivator to try and do it. And I don't know. I think the, I think it was great. Uh, I think it was a great period of time to be in California. I'm, I'm quite sure that a number of things had to come together for me personally to leave the cocoon of the world I was in. You know, I had to live around a whole lot of people who had who would laugh at it, and just say, "Are you kidding? You you want to be happy and successful, or do you want to like be a good newspaper man for mm -hmm. the rest of your life, and you know, die at 75 and you'll have a nice house and mm -hmm. maybe you'll have a summer place." And that's it. Or do you want to just, you know, roll? You got a lot of good ideas. You should make your own destiny. Make your own destiny. Yeah. And it was like, whoa, really? And you know, I watch it, and I watch it. My kids, you know, my my uh, my daughter particularly. She's an entrepreneur now. She's got her own little company. She's 28. She's got a digital production company. I would have been at her age, just petrified to not know where my money was coming from next month. And I watch her. She goes through the, you know, the the terrible roller coaster of having. You know, too much business one month, and, and like, oh my God, I I have to work seven days a week or every day to get all this done, and it's crazy. And then it's like being an actor. You know, the next week it's like nobody wants me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like why aren't they calling me for parts? I just won the Oscar, but doesn't matter. They've forgotten me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it it's it's uh, more and more people are able to have the stomach for that and are willing to have the stomach for that, which is what it's about. And I think it's uh, I think it's great. I mean, I think it's really great. And, and, you know, I look at kids coming out of, it's just at Syracuse, I'm on the board of trustees, and I was talking to the journalism graduating class. There's a lot of nervousness about are there any journalism jobs left. But it's not just the journalism school now, it's PR, it's, you know, advertising, marketing. And I said, look, if you think about it in terms of traditional journalism, you're going to get nervous and panic, but 
the fact is the skill set you've been trained to do is more valuable than it's ever been. And there's a thousand places you can get great jobs. They may not be running, you know, may not be in a newspaper or at a radio station or in a television news operation or even a digital news operation. It might be at Macy's, but they got a story to tell and they need somebody who can tell that story, you know, and you'll, you'll have plenty of opportunity. You're not yeah. going to starve. Yeah. Um, but it's a psych, these psychological changes are happening in every profession, in every way, and they're going to keep happening for, you know, a while. Uh, Larry Kramer, thank you so much for um, telling us your story of experiencing that, that transition. It's, it's been fantastic. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks.